that, Bill. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome to New Zealand. Uh, for years now, one of my bucket list things has been uh, a trip to New Zealand. Uh, we've all read about uh, the expertise that the folks in New Zealand have in terms of grazing management, forage production, uh, water and fencing. And so when uh, about a year and a half ago, I found out that American Foraging Grassland Council was sponsoring a trip to New Zealand, uh, I was one of the first to sign up. Uh, the trip was led by Dr. Dennis Hancock. Uh, we spent uh, two weeks last fall in New Zealand. Keep in mind that uh, uh, fall is early springtime in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, there were 22 members on the tour. Uh, they came from eight states and uh, we enjoyed a great trip. Uh, New Zealand, of course, is in the South Pacific Ocean. It's a thousand miles from uh, Australia, a thousand miles east of Australia. Uh, New Zealand, in terms of area, is about the same size as our state of Colorado. Their population is just slightly more than we have here in Kentucky, uh, something less than five million people. In the North Island, uh, it's about the same uh, latitude that we have here in central Kentucky. Today, we're sitting on the 38th parallel, uh, 38 degrees north of the equator. Uh, there in the North Island of New Zealand is the 38th parallel. Their uh, climate is uh, somewhat similar to ours, but it's a maritime climate. Uh, so their winters aren't as cold as ours, their summers aren't as hot as ours, they have a longer growing season. But the topography is somewhat similar to what we have here in Kentucky. There on the South Island, the, uh, whoops, the uh, predominant uh, topographic feature is the Southern Alps. They're on the north or the west side of the Southern Alps. It's really rainy. They get oodles of rain, it's kind of like our Pacific Northwest. But on the east side of the mountains, particularly in the Canterbury Plains, uh, it's somewhat drier. They get uh, 20 to 25 inches of rain a year. So you'll see irrigation in that area. And if you see row crops, that'll be in that, those Canterbury Plains. <clears throat> Uh, in New Zealand, uh, agriculture is probably their uh, long suit, if you will. Uh, they're made up of dairy farms, beef farms, sheep farms. They produce kiwi fruit, and they also produce a lot of uh, very good wines these days. Forestry is a big business. Seafood's a big business. Tourism and manufacturing are as well. But almost all of this production is exported. And in the case of dairy, 95% uh, of their dairy product is exported. Most of that would be dried product like uh, non-fat dry milk uh, powder. That they, they are the primary market globally in those products. <clears throat> In the mid-1980s, the New Zealand economy was deregulated. And that primarily meant that uh, there were no more ag subsidies. No safety net, no price supports, uh, none of that. It also meant that their extension service was canceled. Uh, ag Research was their federally funded uh, agricultural research agency. That continued to be funded. And by a year or two later, their economy was in the tank. But 10 years later, in the mid-1990s, their economy was flourishing again and continues to do so. Uh, today, they've got uh, some commodity checkoffs that fund uh, commodity marketing efforts and fund uh, what amounts to some extension. Uh, and here, here's some of the observations that I made and, and uh, 
our group made as we were traveling there in New Zealand. One of which is that they make wide use of custom uh, farming operations, planting and harvesting particularly. And we saw that probably mostly on the South Island where the farms are somewhat larger. Uh, but in any part of New Zealand, uh, they really don't rely on equipment much. Uh, a typical farm might have a four-wheeler and a small pickup truck, and that might be it. Uh, they do rely on private consultants for advice and, and uh, where we rely on extension. Uh, there are a number of small farm management groups where maybe 10, 15, 20 producers would get together. They would hire a facilitator to help organize their group. They would meet on each other's farms two or three times a year to uh, uh, view each other's farming strategies and debate those. Then they would meet again at the end of the year and they would compare financial information. So each farmer could compare his information with the benchmark of the average of the group. Uh, other observations, New Zealand offers universal health care. And, uh, you know, as I was thinking about that, maybe that uh, Part of the difference between their agriculture and ours is that so many of us have to take a job in town, or maybe our wife takes a job in town, to provide health insurance. Almost all of the farms that we visited there were smaller operations, family operations, and both the husband and the wife were both there involved uh, day to day in the farm management. Uh, and then the other thing was that housing there in New Zealand seem to be more modest than what we typically see here in the U.S. <clears throat> Other observations, uh, their forage and grazing management seem to be much more professional than what we typically see here. And that extends to financial management as well. We probably visited oh, 12 to 15 dairy herds while we were there. Each of those operators could tell us their cost of production to the penny for the previous year. There are not very many of us that could do that. Uh, their graziers were likely to move animals every day. Not all of them did, but uh, typically they would. Uh, we've already adopted all of their technology in terms of fencing and water management. And most of the, the operations that we saw were small family operations with family labor. This was the first uh, visit on our tour. This was a dairy in the Waikato uh, region of the North Island. It was a seasonal production uh, dairy, which most New Zealand dairies are seasonal. They will all the calves calve in the early spring. They milk spring, summer, fall, and then they're all turned dry at once. That gives the farm operator a chance to get off the farm, maybe to take a vacation, but it also makes management of those young stock, which are all born in the same month, uh, much simpler. This particular herd was milked once a day. They got no concentrates. All of the nutrients that they got came from their pasture. All right, one of the parts of, uh, I mentioned they were professional, very professional in terms of their uh, forage management. Uh, that producer used a rising plate meter similar to this one once a week when he went around and measured the dry matter available for his cows in each of his pastures or paddocks. So his particular meter, was, was an electronic one, so he could download the information from each paddock into a computer, and that produced this graph, which is uh, called a grazing wedge. So that particular week, the most dry matter were in these paddocks over here, and so those would be the paddocks that he would be grazing that week. Uh, and he would repeat the process the next week, and 
probably these paddocks would be the ones that would be grazed next. This is the second dairy that we visited. <clears throat> this, cat, this dairy was a little bit different because they uh, produced milk year round. They didn't calve seasonally. Uh, their cows, you could see them out here in the pasture, but when they uh, came back to the barns, which most New Zealand dairies don't have barns, it's a pretty moderate uh, climate, but when they came back to the barns, they had a TMR waiting for them. So that was a little different and a little more intensive management than we saw more frequently. While we were in Hamilton, we visited the headquarters and the manufacturing facility of the Gallagher Company. Uh, we got to watch them producing their fence energizers and other fencing products. Uh, we see those uh, here in our southern state stores and our other good farm supply stores. So that's another export product from New Zealand. Their topography is somewhat similar to we ha that we have here in Kentucky. It's not all flat, particularly in the North Island. It's pretty rolling and, and in some cases pretty steep. This was uh, at uh, Taupo Beef. It's uh, very close to Lake Taupo there in the North Island. Uh, this couple was, uh, they were buying uh, young heifers, uh, typically Charlet Cross heifers, and they were raising them as grad grass-fed branded beef. Uh, they fed no concentrates. Everything that they got were right here in front of them. And we did sample their beef and it was excellent. This is New Zealand's competitive advantage. Uh, we have Kentucky 31 fescue here. It's pretty much everywhere. You don't really have to do a whole lot to have a stand to that. When New Zealand, they've got perennial ryegrass and ladino clover. Uh, the advantage of that is, of course, that perennial ryegrass is much more palatable and much more digestible than our fescue. So they can get really good grain, gains and uh, milk production from that. We saw a lot of mixed species grazing. It was common to see beef cattle and sheep in the same pasture. Uh, this is another dairy there on the North Island. They were milked in a rotary parlor. This is uh, the milk shed in the background uh, and the Fonterra tanker there to pick up the milk in the foreground. Fonterra is uh, New Zealand's largest dairy co-op and it's also the largest economic entity there in New Zealand. And think about that. Uh, the dairyman is here on the left, he's watching as the milk is being pumped from his uh, tank onto the tanker. And as that happens, it's being sampled for components and some other criteria. About 15 minutes after the tanker leaves the farm, the dairyman will get a text message with those sample results. This is the fielding livestock market in Fielding, New Zealand. It's again on the North Island. Uh, they've been in operation since 1880. It operates right in the middle of the small town of Fielding. It's all on concrete. Uh, they sell sheep. They sell beef cattle, including dairy beef, but uh, dairy females are sold in other markets. If you sell cattle there, they've got to have a health certificate. Uh, they have to have two ear tags, one of which is an RFID tag. And uh, as the cattle leave the sale ring, their RFID tag is scanned. Sale ring is very similar to what you'd see in modern markets here in Kentucky. There are way out sales, the difference being that there's a 15% general sales tax on all livestock uh, purchases, as is everything else in New Zealand. This is a typical uh, livestock transport there in New Zealand. Apparently these are somewhat more uh, maneuverable in small farmsteads than our pots would be. Uh, and, whoops, the, uh, the hitch there collapses so when he backs up to the loading dock, the cattle can walk off from the 
front part of the truck through the back and so he didn't have to disconnect the trailer. We saw no gooseneck trailers there in New Zealand. We saw no pickup trucks that would pull a gooseneck trailer there in New Zealand. Okay, now we're on the, on the South Island. These are the Southern Alps in the background, the Canterbury Plains in the foreground. Uh, lots of uh, irrigation down there. This is the only field of alfalfa that we saw while we were there in New Zealand. Of course, they know it as Lucerne. Uh, we saw some pastured hogs. They were rotated just like sheep and cattle would have been. This is a confined freestalled area. We could see lots of these in the U.S., but very few of them in, in New Zealand. Uh, these cows were milked by robotic milkers, which are pretty common there. This, I thought, was the most innovative uh, dairy that we saw. And this is one of two voluntary milking systems uh, there in New Zealand. But this is the milking shed. There, it's surrounded by three sets of pastures. Pasture A over here, pasture B, and pasture C over here. As the cattle wander out of pasture A in the morning, they go through this set of alleyways with computer-controlled gates. The the gates are operated by the RFID tags. If the cow needs milking, she's shunted through the milking shed where the robotic milker milks her. If the cow doesn't need milking, she's shunted off to pasture B. And that process repeats itself from pasture B to pasture C, pasture C back to pasture A. So all of this happens without a whole lot of human intervention. Uh, if the cow needs breeding or needs veterinary attention, she's shunted off to a holding pen. But uh, this seemed to me, you know, to, to, as a marriage between technology and, and grazing, which you typically see there in New Zealand. Uh, this is a monument there in the hill country of the South Island. Uh, Scottish immigrants came to New Zealand in the 1870s and 1880s. They brought their collie dogs and their sheep with them. Uh, the dogs made uh, managing sheep up in these higher elevations possible. New Zealand has five times more sheep than we have here in the U.S. The last three days of our visit uh, were spent at the, uh, the annual conference of the New Zealand Grassland Association. Uh, and the morning sessions were similar to what we're having here, punctuated by morning tea. They always had morning tea, and they usually had afternoon tea if you were around. And the afternoon sessions were out on farms in that uh, local area. The last day of our visit, we went up into some of the higher elevations. This was at a farm known as Bagroy Station. It was... Uh, owned and operated by a young couple. Uh, and as you can see here, this is stony, rocky, and unproductive ground. They decided to invest some capital here to do something with it. The first thing they did, they had a rock rake that they ran through this and picked up some of the larger rocks. The second thing they did was they ran, ran this uh, roller over it to kind of mash the stones into the ground. They put pure pivot irrigation on it, and then they reseeded it. That's more irrigation, and that's what they got. These are merino sheep, which uh, sell for a good deal more than uh, just the common wool sheep. And that's what it looked like. This is red clover and, and uh, perennial ryegrass. Uh, we didn't see much red clover there in New Zealand. Well, dino clover was everywhere, but uh, red clover has some uh, fungal problems, I think it was, that uh, limit its use, but they were making very good uh, use of it. And so that's all. We saw lots of these uh, signs, please remove your muddy boots. So farmers did get to town. Questions? You get a chance, I'd recommend a trip.
So, so, why, so did they, why did they say they used red clover versus Lodano on the last farm? Well, it's more productive, I think. Uh, on, on the dairy, uh, I, they did have some concentrates in that mo robotic milking uh, stall, uh, probably to get them to come into the stall as much as for nutrients, but that, that was pretty much it. I think they grow some of those, but there, there's a lot of uh, palm kernel imported from uh, Indonesia. And so it's an oil seed, kind of like cotton seed, that they use to supplement. And apparently, it has some problems if you get too much of it in the ration. Uh, the, the question was about variety selection of forages. Uh, we did visit with uh, some uh, plant breeding businesses there in New Zealand. Uh, we saw a lot of their research plots. Uh, most of that research was based around perennial ryegrass, uh, which has some end of bite problems too. Uh, we also visited uh, Lincoln University and Massey University, which is the two universities that uh, do ag research and ag education. Uh, they're all actively involved. And uh, another one of their problems, which I didn't really have time to talk about, is uh, nitrogen leaching. There's a good deal of concern in New Zealand in terms of water quality and they're thinking it's nitrogen leaching through the soil into the water body. Uh, so they're doing a lot of research on that. And there's a, uh, a mandatory uh, program there in New Zealand that's, that will be modifying and how producers operate, which includes stocking rates and fertilization to uh, minimize nitrogen leaching into the water system. So there, there's a, a computer model called Overseer, which at this point I think is kind of a one size fits all, but that dictates how these producers of all species will be able to operate in the future. But they, I'm not sure I answered your question, but uh, there is a good deal of research on variety uh, trials, and uh, there's lots of seed produced in New Zealand as well. Yeah. A lot of them. Uh, they mostly wear rubber boots. Well, they figured out that cattle can, and other species can harvest their own feed and they can scatter their own manure. It's cheaper and it's a lot less expensive. And, t and time, less time too. Doug, why don't you give us the last question? I didn't detect that they had much of a problem with that. I, I think that having the grass and the mixture is the main way they know that they're just really careful when they trim the animals out and getting them used to that white clover. But they do have milk there too. Uh, they just are really careful with what I've observed. I, I think probably another aspect of that is that their, their grazing managers watch the residual pretty closely. They might be, they might only be there for a day. So they're not grazing right down to the ground to get, you know, a lot of that ladino clover. They're getting mostly grass and 
a little clover. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right.